Anthony, Tony, Tony. Liddy Cote, Liddy Cote, Liddy Cote. Any of those. Would which be. which do you prefer? Liddy Cote. Yes. Okay, uh, Tony, if I yeah. may. Uh, what's your job these days? Uh, I'm professor of applied linguistics at the University of Warwick, which means that I teach linguistics and education topics to uh, undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, many of my students are studying languages mm -hmm. at the university here, and I teach the applied linguistics that goes up together okay. with language studies. I work with people who are qualified teachers of English who are developing further qualified... So it's really applied English. linguistics in a very broad yeah. sense. Applied linguistics yeah. in terms of language education, yeah. intercultural communication, and a range of other topics. As Although well. you're known as an intercultural communication person, is that I think bad? I mean as a, an inter, uh, a language education person. Okay, and good. My work has been to try and wake language teachers up to the fact that they're producing people who are going to communicate interculturally. Right. And that, that needs to be the heart and soul of language education. That grammar, vocabulary, stuff like that mm -hmm. is all necessary, yeah. but it's not the end point. And you have to be able to engage with the cultural practices and meaning making. You have to understand the different ways of expression across languages uh, in order to be yeah. an effective communicator. So you're not a translation scholar as such, but you've, you've written on this and you're interested in it, is that? Yeah, um, I have written on it because I got interested in it, yeah. because it was a part of other things I was interested right. in. Right. So, as one of the things I was doing while I was here, still here in, in Australia, I was teaching students, language students, some translation. Okay. Uh, uh, of just a single, single module in translation. Mm. And the purpose was to get them to start thinking about the language differently to get them away from the idea that there's a word in language X and there's a word in language Y and all you have to do is find the Y that equals the X right, and right. everything was done. And okay. that it was actually an interpretive process that you had to actually rethink meaning in order to re-express it. And trying to get them to start thinking more interculturally about it and using translation as a way of doing that. Okay, so it's and translation as part of, of something bigger. Of something bigger, yeah. As, as part of intercultural communication yeah. itself, yeah. That, uh, that the translation is yet another way into the intercultural. Good. And because it's written, you've got these nice static texts that allow you time for reflection, mm -hmm. and you can go away and spend a week worrying about this word, and then come back and do something. You can't do that in spoken communication. Uh, so the, the text uh, gives something that you can do extended reflection on. It also has a context that it carries around with it. And trying to get to students just to think about, for example, you're having trouble with this expression. But don't think of this expression as this group of words. Think of it as part of a meaning in a much larger text. And what's actually going on in this text? How are there other things in this text? relevant to the meaning at this point in the text, what does it actually mean in English? Yeah. And then how do you express that in the other language? So it's a language analysis, a language interpretation thing that I was particularly interested in. So you're doing this within additional language education? Yes. Um, so you're definitely not one of these people who believe in immersion, language no. teaching, or communicative approach that excludes translation? I'm, Do I'm you get opposition <laughs> within, within the course, language education community? I mean, yeah. I'm actually an advocate of using the student's first language in language classes, okay. not just in okay. translation. There are certain times when the learning needs at a particular moment in a language classroom require one language rather than the other. Mm -hmm. And what should be driving our decisions are students' learning needs, not some ideology of monolingualism or something like that. Okay. Because I think the monolingual language classroom is an absolute disaster because we're training multilinguals. And if we can only train multilinguals by making them monolinguals, what on earth are we doing? Uh, and so the my work has been all about bringing the other languages into the language classroom so that the learning can be as effective as possible. Okay. Let's go back from when you were a 
23, 24, 25 or so. Mm. Where, where were you? I was a PhD student. Mm. And as a PhD so student... So where are you from first? I'm from Australia. You're the, uh, you have the best concealed Australian accent <laughs> I've ever heard. I okay. grew up in a very small rural community right. and you need some protective Where was, Where was that? A uh, place called Meribar in Victoria. Okay, all right. Uh, so, so you got to a PhD where then? At the University of Melbourne. All right, okay. Uh, and being a very sensible person with well-planned career options, I decided Norman French dialectology was the thing to do as a PhD. <laughs> Uh, and so at that time, I was doing field work in Jersey and Sark, um, left Australia for the very first time, was based in Paris. Um, my undergraduate degree is in French, so that had always been, been a passion for me. And really, I did a PhD, so I didn't have to leave university and do something else, and so that I could continue working with French. Uh, and. So I come from this small country town, went to the big city, and had now left the country with an interest in language and, and, and so on. And the thing that I learned from my PhD in, in Norman French was actually that that wasn't what I was interested in. And that what I was interested in was actually the ways that language is peopled. Because, I mean, I did sort of traditional linguistics I was great at certain tax, historical phonetics. Mm -hmm. I love these things. I, to this day, I love these things. But I was working with um, a community whose language was dying. And you can't just think about vocabulary and syntax in that sort of situation. You start to think about people as language users. And that sort of became the impetus for everything that I've done ever since. I want to see the people in the language. Mm -hmm. And for me, and because of the lived experiences I've had, the people in the language is the intercultural. Sure. That's where yeah. it, it all comes down to uh, the key focus, not just of language use, but of language education. Uh, I, as a French speaker, I'm always an intercultural communicator. I don't find very many other Australians in small country towns who communicate in French. Uh, it's, it's always got to be somewhere else. Okay. Your career has been largely in Australia, is yes, that correct? I left Australia just over a year ago. So everything I've done yeah, here... At, at different yeah, universities. At different universities, yes. Yeah. Has it been a tough fight in Australia to, uh, to get people put into language education? Yes, it's definitely been tough. Um, it's, I think people have the sense that it's getting tougher. I'm not sure it has. Um, there have been waves. Sometimes mm. it gets a bit easier, sometimes it contracts. I don't think here in Australia multilingualism is valued. Mm. And I don't think it's valued by governments. I don't think it's valued by university administrators, senior management. Uh, the people who are making the decisions are very often monolingual individuals who've reached positions of power as monolingual mm. individuals and can't see that they missed out on anything because they weren't multilingual. And in a sense, it's really hard to argue with some vice chancellor to say, yes, but if you spoke another language, you'd be successful. <laughs> um, and I, I, it, it is, is it better in the United Kingdom? No. Okay, really so the, it's so. The, same, the same struggle. It's the same struggle. Basically. Because it, of being an English-speaking country. Uh, that's what I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I've not been there very long. It's, yeah, yeah. it's a hasty judgment. But I had expected the proximity to Europe to have influenced thinking a bit mm. more than it has. Um, I mean, it's an odd time to be talking about proximity to No, Europe, it doesn't matter, does Brexit it? <laughs> With Brexit. Brexit. Brexit and all of those sorts yeah. of things. But you can sort of see Brexit as symptomatic. Yes. As this sort of general rejection of the other and I mean in Australia I thought it was geographical isolation mm. because okay Australia is a big country you have to travel a long way in an aeroplane before you even get out of it uh, you go to Asia where English is quite widespread yeah. uh, it's a very different context from Europe. Yeah. so I was thinking the UK very close very much more integrated and so on that it would be different 
he just gave a really good plenary pointing out the class divisions in language learning. Mm. That, that the higher you are in the class scale, the more languages you're going to get at, at, at yeah. university. And you say that's similar in Australia. I think it is. Yeah. It's, this is a real... Um, no, we can say the same thing about translation, you know, that, that you know, we're catering to a certain social class that has these languages. Yes, and I find, it, I find it really worrying that language learning has become differentiated by class, that the educated middle class are going to have more opportunities than other people. Mm. People who are attracted to academic education are going to have more opportunities than people who are attracted to professional education. Mm. And has not it always been like that? Well, yeah, though? it has. No. But what worries me is that the discourses we've got are not about that. Oh, right, have yes. All of these utilitarian yes. discourses. Yes, of yes, yes. That sort of says you need language for your job and you need language for mobility and all of those sorts of things. Fine. But if language for your job and language for mobility is for the educated middle classes, mm. what on earth is happening to all of those people who are expecting to have these successful professional experiences mm. and are not getting the linguistic diversity, the intercultural capabilities and those sorts of things that go with a good language yeah. program. Yeah. Final question, what, what kind of research do you think we need? I think we've started to answer that just there, but do you have any ideas of areas that, that uh, beginner doctoral students might want to think about? Oh, there are so many. And in a sense, I think that a lot of what we're thinking about now is, is totally new. And I think what we don't really know is how multilingual, multicultural individuals are actually using mm. their abilities in, in the world. Um, and that can be anything. It can be in workplaces, it can be in, in life choices, it can be in uh, things like trans the workers translators. Mm -hmm. What is it that's actually being brought? And I think in research we're focused too much on the sort of macro populations and sort of yeah. there are studies that sort of say, okay, if you've got these sorts of degrees and these sorts of languages, you'll get these sorts of incomes and so on, which tell us almost nothing. But that's a good argument <laughs> for, for learning good languages. Argument. It's a good argument. Yeah. But it tells us almost nothing about what it means to be a multilingual, multicultural individual mm. at this moment in time. Yeah. And so what is it that people are actually doing with these abilities? What is it that in their particular lives are being, is being brought by their multilingualism, their multiculturalism and so on? Do you think that that kind of approach can be applied to translation or is translation to narrow a, a field? Oh, no, I think that would be yeah. um, really really useful. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting when I read translation studies is that there's a lot of focus on the translator and the text. Mm -hmm. There's not so much focus on the translator as a human being mm -hmm. and as an interculturally capable person. And I think it would be really interesting to know what the interculturally capable translator actually does in their lived experience that resources them mm -hmm. to do this sort of translation. And it can't be inferred from the text. Uh, one of the things that got me interested in, in, in uh, translation was the act of interpretation. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that each individual is going to read the text in a particular way and not realize what it is that they bring to the text that gives them this interpretation as if their reading was somehow perfectly natural. And so, in language education, one of the things we've been talking a lot about is what do you bring to the interaction that creates the intercultural moment? Mm. I think the same, same thing in translation. Is what do you bring to this translation that makes you the person to translate it this way? Tony Lydic, thank you very much. Thank you.